Hello, I'm Asanya Morrison, and this is Keeping It Real Estate. The largest financial transaction most people will undertake in their lives will be the purchase or sale of a home. That being said, the amount of misinformation, miseducation, and flat-out mythology about real estate is astounding to those of us who work in the business every day. This program was created by Realtors as an avenue of distributing solid information to you, the consumer. The topic for today is how to be a great seller. But first, let me introduce our guest panel. Debbie Z is an associate broker at Real Living Key Realty, the 2016 president of the Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors, the 2015 Region 2 vice president of the Women's Council of Realtors, and a member of the Women's Council of Realtors, Frank Tarala is the broker and owner of Principles Broker Network, the 2015 president of the Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors, and a governor of the My Real Comp Multiple Listing Service. Cindy Manciero is the director of training and education at Keller Williams Lakeside, a governor of the Real Comp Multiple Listing Service, and an officer and board member of the Lake Point chapter of the Women's Council of Realtors. Along with myself, these agents average over 20 years in business and combined have sold over $250 million of residential real estate. So let's talk about what it really means to sell your house. Frank, let's start with you. When should you start preparing to sell your house? May I believe you should start today even if you're not thinking about selling your home because buyers can detect a home that's been cared for every day and a home that someone's been trying in the last few weeks to put it together to be ready to sell. So uh, to get your home physically ready for sale today and then you should also mentally get yourself ready to sell also because there's a process to it and, and your agent will explain what that process is that will make it easier for you as you go through the sale process. Okay, that's really great information. Um, and you know, let's talk about what's really important to every single seller, every single time a home is sold. How do we come up with the right price? And who's responsible for paying what? Cindy, could you start us off on talking about how to price a home to sell? Sure, May. Um, when we sit down to do find out to how much your house is valued at, we first get all the information, the style of your home, the square footage, the area, the school district, and then we go into our um, multiple list system and we pull all the comparable homes that sold. I also go into the um, uh, community, whether it be the township or the city, and check to see if there's any other houses there that might have been sold by owner. And we are looking for apple to apple comparisons because we have to price your home for the right price because when it sells it has to appraise out. So we try to use the same guidelines that the appraisers use when they come in and have to appraise your home for a mortgage. Okay, so basically if the guy across the street from me has a colonial and he just got a fabulous price and I went, oh, you know, I got this great little ranch here and maybe it's my time to sell, he's probably not the guy who can be my comparable then. No, you're okay. you're right about that. All right, <laughs> yeah, and that's important to know. We know it, but you know it's important for everybody to know that. Debbie, let's get to the nitty gritty. What's it going to cost me to sell, and who is responsible for paying what? Well, you shouldn't really have any upfront costs as a seller. There are sometimes you may have a well and septic inspection that you pay for, but again, that can be negotiated away. But the, the agent is the one that takes all the responsibility and all the risk at this point in time. They pay for all of the advertising, they pay for all of the multi-list system information, they pay for anything that may go on to make flyers or videos or photographs or anything like that of your home. And they're hoping that in the end the home sells and they do get paid. But the main cost to a seller uh, are the brokerage fee, the state and county transfer tax, and also the title insurance policy. There are some other, um, you know, basic costs such as paying off the mortgage, and you may have to have a wire transfer for that mortgage and different things like that, but those are kind of absorbed in the um, credits that come back to the seller. So really, the seller can do this with not anything really out of pocket, and the agent takes all the risk in the hopes that we do come to a, a uh, transaction in the end and that everyone walks away happy and we've been paid and everybody's happy then. 
Great. And I think something that you really want to know as a consumer is that we're going to give you an idea of what it's going to cost you up front. Most of the agents sitting here do the same thing I do. We have a seller net out sheet. So we're going to estimate, you know, we're going to guess Here's your sales price that we think we can get you. And then we're going to break it down from there. So you're going to have a really good idea before that sign even goes in your yard of what you're going to walk away with. Frank, earlier we mentioned cleaning and organizing. I think everybody knows that they need to not leave dirty clothes on the floor or dirty dishes in the sink. Can you address that subject a little bit more in depth? Sure, mate. I always look at that it's not convenient for a seller to be for sale because they always have to have their home ready for guests to come over so it's not always easy to have your home like that in that condition but it's important to have beds made dishes out of sinks in the dishwasher so that your house shows better as people are walking through and seeing it but you can't forget also the smells of a home that if there are pets or if someone smokes or whatever that source might be that that also is taken care of and also the sounds of a house that doors don't squeak or floors yeah. don't squeak so that they all go together and complement each other as your home is being shown to a buyer and i think all of us know we've walked in the door of a home with buyers and we can tell the homes straight out that are well maintained <laughs> mm -hmm. and the ones that just threw themselves on the market quickly. I'll tell you my two biggest points of interest are the cold air returns. Those need to be vacuumed and when you walk into the front door not seeing cobwebs or dust webs or anything like that in your front foyer outside because that's always a telltale to me that oh they do keep everything up. Exactly. Okay so you've cleaned, painted, organized, trimmed, and you've cleaned some more. You've got the right price and determine the day the house will hit the market. How does showing my house work? So what we're going to do here is I'm going to take off my glasses and we're going to role play a little bit. I'm going to be the seller and read you guys some questions and I want you to just jump in and answer. And uh, the first one is, do I have to be home for every showing? I would prefer you not be home. You have such an emotional attachment to that home that people are not going to feel comfortable to say, oh, I'm not sure that I like this, but I could probably fix it. They're going to be quieter. They're going to be more intimidated to open cupboards, open closets, things like that if you're sitting there. And it makes everybody a little bit uncomfortable. They see you living in your home and they say, oh, maybe I'm not as fancy as she is and I'm not going to fit in this home. So I think it's better to let the agent and the buyers go through the home without having that intimidation factor. Okay. so. If I'm not at my house, are you going to be? Usually we're not at the house for the showings, but you need to understand that a licensed agent will be here with them. Most buyers today work with a buyer's agent. They hire a, a real estate agent to work with them and help them find their dream home. So they will be with them, uh, and then we call them and get the feedback. Okay. Will the other agent, well, I guess you just said it, the other agent's always going to be with the people who are in my house? Uh, yes, we have a uh, form that you sign that you're specific about wanting these um, uh, buyers to be accompanied, you know, in person with an agent. And so, yes, that is something that mm -hmm. is up to you to do. Great. What if somebody steals something or damages something during the showing? Those things do happen, but I would just say that in theft, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, that you have your seller counsel, that valuables are, are put out of sight so that we don't tempt an honest person. Uh, another favorite of thieves are medications, so you have to be careful about your medications in your house also. Uh, but I would say in my experience that that really does solve the problem that w w there's not an issue with thefts going on at showings because agents are careful about counseling sellers to be prepared and have their house ready in the right manner. Yeah, I think you're right. Can I turn a showing down? Sure you can, if it's not a convenient time for you. But generally speaking, um, I tell my sellers to try and accommodate most showings, especially in the first couple of weeks because that's generally when most of your uh, buyers are going to come through and you're probably going to get an offer then. 
So you try not to turn them down, but if it's not convenient, always, uh, I tell my sellers, always give the, our receptionist another time that is more convenient for you so that you can reschedule that appointment. Okay, and how do I know that that person who's looking at my house can actually afford to buy it? Well, we can't always guarantee that, but most professional realtors don't work with people unless they've been pre-approved by a lender. And we all know that things can happen between the time they're pre-approved and they actually purchase something. But for the most part, uh, I think the professionalism uh, standard is, is that we work with, with buyers that are pre-approved. Okay. And will I know that the agent was actually at my house? If the appointment's at 1 o'clock and I come back at 3, how will I know they were there? Customary, we encourage agents to leave a card, number one. Most agents do what we call feature sheets, so they set out a little brochure at the house and the trigger is that when you pick up the brochure you leave a card. Our office also when they confirm appointments they'll say make sure you leave a card, make sure you lock all the doors, things like that and if there's ever a question that's the first phone call we make to find out did you actually get in, was there a problem, was there an emergency that you didn't make it and we do encourage people if you're going to miss an appointment or be early or late please call the office so that we can make sure that the seller is aware of that. And Back to that question about how do I know if the person looking at it can really buy it and can I turn that showing down, can, can I require those people to let me know a day or two in advance if they want to show it? Like, can I, can I say nobody can call me for appointments today, they all have to be tomorrow? They can me, but again, I think it's kind of what Cindy said, is you want to make sure that you don't pigeonhole your showing time so tight that it's not convenient for buyers to see it. So many times a seller will turn down a showing and say, well, how is tomorrow? Well, if tomorrow was good, the buyer would be scheduling that appointment for tomorrow. <laughs> right. They would like to be in today. And we're, we're not going to get an offer typically until we have a showing, so they're very important. What I have found that works well for seller convenience is sometimes agents put in that uh, there's no lead time to the appointment so that someone could just call on a spur of the moment. I'll usually put in a two or three hour notice so at least that it's not someone who's calling that's at the curb. Although if they were at the curb, I would tell my seller, if you can get them in, <laughs> let's get them in. So. That's for exactly. sure. Exactly. Well, I really think that helps clear up the showing process. Okay, so let's role play again and talk about what happens when that offer comes in. So again, I'm going to be the seller. Mm. Do I have to accept an offer if it comes in? You don't have to accept an offer if it comes in. However, if it's full price and full terms, you do owe that commission even if you choose not to sell it. And the reason you don't, don't sell it can't be any of the protected reasons that you are being, um, you know, you can't discriminate. discriminate. That's the <laughs> word I'm looking for. So as long as you're not discriminating based on, you know, something that you're not allowed to discriminate against, then you can say no, it's not the right offer, and maybe you change your mind on the price and you think you need a little bit more money and that's always a possibility as well. Okay, and how do I get multiple offers? Because I hear, you know, that's really the way you want to go. How does that happen? You've got to price it right. It's got to be priced right on the money. And if you're looking at a range, well, I think it's going to sell between 210 and 230. If you price it at 209, it will probably sell pretty quickly with that multiple offer possibility. Okay, and I've heard that if you get those multiple offers that they do this highest and best thing. What does that mean and does it mean that I have to take the highest offer that comes in? No, it doesn't mean you have to take the highest offer, uh, but what it does do is it alerts the agents who have uh, you know, potential buyers for that home that they're up against another offer, so we encourage them to write the best offer that they can put forward so that when you're looking at all the offers, the seller can choose the right one for them. And it may not be the highest offer. Right. So okay. it just depends on the offers and you have to look at everything. So if I got, if my house was listed at 200 and I had this multiple offers and I got a 205 offer that was with a mortgage but I got a 200 cash offer, I could still just take that 200 cash then. Right. Absolutely, okay. yes. Okay, that's great. Um, how will I know, again, back to that question, how will I know if they really can't afford my house? I don't want to take an offer, and then what if they can't afford to buy my house? 
Well, we don't always know that. We take the offer, they go through their home inspections. Uh, I do um, for my sellers, and I know you know Debbie and Frank do too, is we do call the lender before we present these offers and try and get um, as much information as we can on how what process they use to um, approve the buyer. So that's about the only thing we can do, and then go with that letter. Right, and make sure that there's not a, that it doesn't need to be contingent on them selling a home or mm -hmm. something that may have been omitted from the offer, just erroneously, not any malice done, but sometimes you just want to ask those questions of that lender to get a good feeling that, yes, this is a really good, qualified, solid buyer. You know, one thing I'll ask uh, the other agent when I have offers on my properties is, how did the buyer select their lender? Because yeah. if it is a lender that that agent uses, I will have more confidence because I know that that agent would not be doing business with a predatory lender or a lender who's not qualified themselves to determine if a purchaser has the ability yeah, to buy. Absolutely. Um, what are back off offers and how do I get one? Well, backup offers are offers that um, come in or are accepted after you've accepted the first offer. Um, and uh, sometimes if there's a long period uh, for the inspection uh, or if um, it's going to be contingent on something, uh, then you might take a backup offer. But again, you have to disclose that to all parties, the buyer's agent, the buyer, and everybody has to be in agreement with that. Um, but you can take backup offers. Okay, and Debbie, you mentioned a minute ago something about contingencies. What is a contingent offer? A contingent offer is, there's two standard contingencies typically in an offer. One is of a home inspection, and that, depending on how the purchase agreement reads, it could be for any reason that the buyer may have dissatisfaction with the house, they can withdraw their offer to purchase, take back their earnest money deposit, and move along. The second contingency is mortgage contingency. If for some reason they don't qualify for that mortgage in the end, or they lose their job the week before closing and can't close, they then retain their deposit and that comes back to them. So it's kind of, this needs to happen so this can happen. Okay. And you can have contingent upon um, a pool inspection or contingent upon, you know, grandma seeing the house next Friday and agreeing that she can put up the money for it or something like that. Anything can be a contingency. And again, that's something that the seller looks at to say, gee, this officer offers loaded with contingencies. I like this one that's a little bit cleaner. So we look at all those things in weighing. Okay. An offer. Um, what are concessions and why should I give them? You know, <laughs> We're all smiling. Oh, yeah. We all love this question. You know, it, it makes me laugh because years ago I had a buyer say to me, well, if I'm going to pay more for the house to get the concessions, what is the seller really conceding? And so a concession is what we call it, but it's more like a contribution by a, a seller. Uh, because it typically doesn't change their bottom line right. when they make this contribution. But I find that there's two types of concessions. There's concessions where the buyer wants to leverage themselves as much as they can with the great mortgage rates today. And then there's the buyer who really needs that money to make this transaction stay together. If it's the latter, then I always just tell my seller, look, your house wouldn't be worth what it's worth unless this type of financing was available to this buyer. If it's the one who wants to leverage, we can't forget that that does put a little more stress on the appraisal. Um, so that buyer, we would maybe kick that around a little bit based on the whole content of the offer. But if it's someone that needs those funds, let's keep those funds in the offer. And I wanna explain that just a little bit more. So if your house is listed at 150 and you want to get 145 out of it. So someone comes along, they bring you a 145 offer, but they've got the down payment, but they're going to be a couple thousand dollars short of the money they actually need to close uh, towards their closing costs. What will happen is they could give you a 147 offer you're only going to get 145000 and that $2,000 difference gets credited towards the purchaser's costs at closing. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about concessions. They're kind of confusing when you look at them on paper, but they're very, very common, and especially in our market today. Um, sure. One more question here. What happens if I need to stay in the house 
longer than the date I agreed to close at. Hopefully you knew that ahead of time mm -hmm. and negotiated into the purchase agreement occupancy. Typically it's paid at the, the new buyer's monthly payment and you figure out what that is per day and you say okay this mortgage plus the taxes and the insurance divided by 30 days is $62 a day. So they're going to hold back that money from your proceeds for 30 days at $62 a day and then it's kind of like a hotel. The night you stay you the seller um, pays that money and the nights that they turn the keys in the buyer you know they're done paying that so it's you can do that and but you need to have negotiated that up front you can't just decide the week before closing oh guess what I'm gonna stay in the house for three weeks because it's contractual law and you have to get that renegotiated at that point okay exactly so we've kinda of talked about this offer process alright we've got this accepted offer what are the three big things that happen Debbie, you're going to start me off on the home inspection. The home inspection, there's going to be a time frame that it needs to be completed within. And typically, again, you've got to read the purchase agreement because sometimes it will say the uh, inspection needs to be done within seven days. And then they have two days following that to get back with you if there's anything they want to ask for. Other contracts just straight out say you've got seven days or ten days to do the inspection and report back. So the buyer going to is going to hire an inspector. They're going to pay the inspector. The agent and the buyer are going to follow the inspector around where the inspector is really given a good education on how the house works. This is how you change the furnace filter. This is how you switch the humidifier. This is how you check this. This is, you know, clean your gutters twice a year. They give a lot of great tips and really show the buyer how the house runs. So that's a great thing. And it all has to be done within the time frame of the contract. And if there's anything that the buyer is not happy with, now we're opening up negotiations again. And you can agree to make repairs, you can agree to do nothing, you can agree to a credit, you can agree to all sorts of things, a price reduction, something like that, but it's all a series of negotiation. That's why it's so important to have a professional doing this because it is really hard to negotiate those things on your own behalf. Okay. May, can I just add something yeah, to that also? Um, often buyers are counseled not to use a home inspector that's per referred to by the agent uh, because of that relationship and I would say and I think Cindy and Debbie would totally agree with me is that if I had a home inspector that I was referring to buyers the minute there would be a problem wrong with that house that buyer would call me so if I yeah. was fielding those calls from buyers that'd be detrimental to everyone the inspectors that the agents do provide for referral are are typically very well qualified inspectors to service the buyers yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah, and I like when they say to a young couple, if you were my children, I would let you buy this house. Or if you were my kids, I would say maybe find something else. So that sometimes, you know, is a nice putting themselves in that position. Well, and I think all of you do the same thing I do. Um, I tell my clients, call the home inspectors before you make that yes. appointment. Talk to them and hire the person you can talk to the best. You've got to be able to communicate with this person. You've got to be able to understand what they're saying to you at your home inspection. So be your own advocate and, and do a little bit of do a little bit of legwork before you actually hire someone. Um, Frank, you wanna tell us a little bit about the appraisal? Um, appraisal is certainly part of that mortgage contingency. If the property doesn't appraise, that puts into play certain choices that have to be made. People often ask, how long does this process take? And the process is where an order is sent out. And if an appraiser accepts that order, the process continues. If they decline that order, that process starts over. So you really don't know how long that can take. When the appraisal comes in, if it comes to value, everybody's happy and yeah. we just keep processing towards a closing. If it doesn't come into value, you can, there is a process to contest an appraisal. There's never a guarantee, but mm -hmm. there is that process. And if it's a government loan, if there are any uh, uh, repairs that might be needed before that loan can be uh, approved for closing. And I want to point out again what Cindy started us off with on that appraisal. When you have that agent out initially and you're doing that market analysis and you're choosing those comparable properties, this is when that comes into play. 
Um, you know, we're going to give copies of our comparables. We're going to leave them there for the appraiser. So the appraiser knows what we used to come up with the price that we put on the house. Um, it's a great big deal, and it mm -hmm. definitely is going to affect your sale. I know as a listing agent, I do my absolute best to attend every appraisal. I do just too. to make sure that there's no questions, make sure that if there's anything I want the appraiser to know, they want to know how old is the roof, how old is the furnace, how old are any of the upgrades that have been done because that all makes a difference in their appraisal. So I make sure that I've got that typed out for them. Mm -hmm. I try not to say too much because that would, you know, be crazy. So, <laughs> but I do, you know, I do provide that to them to make their job as easy as I can with the comparables. And one more great big issue at closing is the title insurance process. Cindy, you want to tell us a little bit about what that is? Well, title insurance is something that the seller pays for, and pretty much um, it has to be clear uh, and it's an insurance policy against anything that might not have been caught, like liens from previous uh, work that had been done or whatever. But generally speaking, as a listing agent, I will order that appraisal paperwork uh, probably within a day or two after I've had, got the house listed. You know, once all the pictures are up and everything's all set with that, I order the title work. And that way we can catch anything early that might be on there. And with what we just went through in the last nine years, uh, what I'm seeing happening a lot is a lot of people were refining mm -hmm. back in 2009, mm -hmm. 2010, 11, and some of those mortgages were not released. So the title company has time to go back and do that, and that can take up to 30 days. Yeah. So if there's any clouds on the title, and, and that's something that we call a cloud on the title when there's a lien on there that had been paid off, but it just wasn't removed. Um, and that gives the, um, the buyer some peace of mind that the property was researched and that there's nothing on there that they're going to become liable for after closing. So title insurance can, can, uh, can mean a lot. And the other thing is, is if you have a trust or you have oh, a deceased oh, yes. member, these are things that, you know, your agent should be able to tell you, hey, I'm going to need death certificates, I need a copy of the trust, whatever it is, and you need to get that to the title company as well so they can get what they need, and then if they need something else, we're ready for when we get that buyer because we want to close these as quickly as possible. The other thing I want to bring up is during this last 10 years, we had a lot of loan modifications where mm -hmm. people either extended their loan out to reduce their payments or they had some other kind of arrangement they made with their bank and that really needs to be told up front because there may be twenty thousand dollars of deferred payment mm -hmm. that are going to come due when you sell that yes. house so make sure that if you've got any kind of uh, loan modification let your agent know so that they can start researching that through the title company as quick as possible mm -hmm. absolutely so guys i think we've pretty much brought it to the end what's left Closing day, yeah. the thing that you were after all along. You'll sign papers, your home will be officially sold, and you'll hand over the keys. There's one last piece of advice that every agent here will give you. Don't expect the experience to be unemotional. After all, the, your home yeah. is the place you built your life. Part of the reason we're here is to help separate you from the emotion of selling the place your memories happened. With some good planning, we'll do just that. I hope you've enjoyed our inaugural program. Check back in the next few months as we continue the series with other issues surrounding the real estate process. Real. I'm Masanya Morrison. Thanks for watching.